I, uh, I wanted to include that song this morning. I wonder if we could just sing it one more time. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed His grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Amen. I'm glad we can still we can still sing that song. I'm glad we can still pray and invoke God's blessing on our nation. Uh, Wednesday night I did a little message and I if you if you, if you want to you know get a copy or it's on YouTube you can watch it. Or, uh, and Wednesday night I talked about some of the bad stuff. How many people know there's some bad stuff in our society in our culture? There's some there's some bad stuff. We've as a nation we've turned our back on God. As a people it seems more and more not entirely because we still have people worshiping Jesus. We still have people getting saved. God is still at work saving people and doing things. But there's a lot of things going on. That was Wednesday night. But this morning, I'm here to tell you, I'm glad I live in the United States of America. I know we could list all the faults, but this morning, I just want to talk a little bit about how we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our nation. How many people uh, remember a fellow named Yakov Shmirnov? You ever, you ever hear that name? He was a comedian. He came here from Russia. He was, uh, uh, you know, he, during the Cold War, when it was still communist Russia. He came here, and he, he used to say, what a country. You know, remember him, you know, he just loved America. And somebody asked him one time, he said, what do they have here, or what do they have here that they, that they didn't have in Russia that, you, that, you, that you're grateful for? And he said, warning shots, okay? I mean, we live in a great, now some of you know what I'm talking about. We live, we live in a wonderful, I, I would, there's not another place on this earth that I would want to live. I'm so thankful I was born in the United States. Of America and I believe that we're called as believers in this land to pray to pray for our leadership to pray for our culture to do to be salt and light in the middle of this wicked and perverse generation because I believe the judgment is coming God's going to he has to judge sin but until he does it's our job to occupy that's what Jesus said occupy until I come okay that word occupy doesn't mean d just filling up space, okay? When we say occupy, we just kind of fill up space. Well, now he, he didn't mean that. He meant to actively occupy, actively be an influence to the world around us. And that's what we're called to be. If in, in the Old Testament, and I'm going I'm to be reviewing a few things here, and we're going to look at, look, look at God's Word in a minute. But in the Old Testament... All the way back in the book of Genesis, there was a, uh, a city that was founded way back in Genesis, like chapter 11. And the city's name was Babylon. How many people have heard of Babylon? Babylon. And from Genesis to Revelation, Babylon has personified everything that is evil in the world. Everything that is against Christ, everything that is antichrist, Everything that is rebellion against God, everything from the, from the building of the Tower of Babel, that was all about rebellion against God and trying to be independent from God. From the building of the Tower of Babel all the way to the book of Revelation where it talks about Babylon the Great is fallen. It's personified everything that's evil in the world. Now the city of Babylon that was built by a guy named Nimrod way back in, in Genesis, that city no longer stands. The ruins are there. Uh, and you can, you can uh, old Saddam Hussein, remember him? <laughs> he wanted to be like the second Nebuchadnezzar, and he wanted to rebuild Babylon, and he didn't get the chance to do it. Okay? But, uh, but the, the ruins are there. There's some folks that think that Babylon is going to be rebuilt. 
But I don't think it's going to be rebuilt because Babylon is more than a city. It's a mindset. It's an idea. I, I can say this today that th those of us that live in the United States of America, we are dwelling in the midst of modern day Babylon. Now, again, somebody said, I thought he was going to talk about good stuff this morning. I'm, I'm getting there, honest. I am. Okay, I am. Babylon is about everything that's against Christ. And what we see happening in our world today, we see uh, our nation, which was founded, if, if, you, if you get the thing for Wednesday night, we talked about how our founding fathers, some people said they founded it on biblical principles and so forth. They really founded it on enlightenment principles. Yet still, they, they left open the door for liberty and freedom. That we could worship any way we wanted to worship. They didn't impose uh, uh, a state-imposed uh, religion. Thank God they didn't. Because the places in Europe that had state-imposed religions it ended up being dead dry. And I believe that God has blessed our nation throughout the centuries. 200 and... I some do the math. From 1776 until now. God has blessed the United States of America. If you look at, at places in, in, in our history where God intervenes supernaturally in battles and, and, uh, and, and, and things like that, where he, he allowed this nation to flourish. And somebody might ask the question, well, uh, Pastor Carmen, if, you know, I, I heard what you had to say on Wednesday night, and uh, how could God bless that? Listen, I believe God has blessed this nation for two reasons. Two reasons. The first reason is, when this nation was founded, God had prepared this land for the founding of this nation. I believe His hand was in the founding and the beginning of this nation because, number one, He knew that when He would restore His people Israel to their land, they would need a friend. And since 1948 and even before there, the United States has been the best friend that Israel has had. The last few years, that has been waning. And not just with this administration either. Going back eight or ten years, that's, that's, been, that's been being uh, eroded. That friendship, that support we have for Israel. But I believe that God has blessed this nation because the Bible said, God told Abraham, whoever blesses you, I'll bless and whoever curses you, I'll curse. So that's one reason I believe God has blessed this nation. Another reason I believe God has blessed this nation is because he prepared this nation. His hand was in the founding and propagation of the United States of America because he knew it would be a place where the gospel could flourish and be preached to all the world. He made us the most prosperous, the most, uh, uh, the, the, the most free, free enterprise, of, of, of monetary free system supposedly. He gave us the, this ability to amass great amounts of wealth. And there have been those people who love the Lord, have used their wealth to have spread the gospel everywhere. And I believe God has prepared the United States of America for that purpose, that the gospel could go throughout all the world. If you read in the scriptures, you find out, when we talk about Babylon, that God prepared Babylon for a purpose. As wicked as it was, as evil as it was, God had a purpose for Babylon being there. Because about 600 years before Christ, God's people... The Israelites, the Jews, they continually rebelled against Him. They continually fell into idolatry. And He told them through the prophets, He says, I'm going to deliver you into captivity. And He used Babylon as a place where He would house His people for 70 years. He, uh, the, the city was destroyed, but after those 70 years, the people were allowed to come back and rebuild the city. But God used that pagan nation for a purpose, for His divine purpose. I hope I'm making sense to somebody. God is using and blessing the United States and has used and blessed the United States for a purpose. But just like Babylon, there was a time when God's purpose for Babylon had ended. There's going to come a time when God's purpose for the United States is going to end. Does that mean we should throw up our hands and say, oh, well, it's all... No, we ought to pray for our leaders. And I'm going to show you why. If... We're going to eventually, if we ever get into the Bible, and we are, we're going to read Daniel chapter 4. Okay? Daniel chapter 4. But let me give you a little introduction to Daniel. How many people here have ever read the book of Daniel in the Old Testament? 
Uh, last year, a few months ago, we did a series of messages on the book of Daniel. You can either get copies or go on our website, and we have them on there. By the way, our website was down for a couple of days. It should be back up now. But uh, if you go on there, and, and you can listen to the messages, and you can kind of get you know, a, a better idea. I'm not going to go into detail here. But I want you to, to understand, the book of Daniel was about a young man named Daniel who was taken captive by the Babylonians. About 600 years before Christ, when King Nebuchadnezzar, how many people have heard that name? Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He was the greatest king at, at that time. He, Babylon was the most powerful nation on the earth at that time. He came and he conquered Jerusalem. And uh, he didn't destroy it right away. It was like three waves where he destroyed Jerusalem. But the first time he came, he, what Nebuchadnezzar did was he looked for some of the most promising young Babylonian men. Uh, I'm sorry, for the most promising young Jewish men. Like Daniel, and he had three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These young men who had wisdom and intelligence. And he took them back to Babylon. And he didn't put them in prison, but what he did was he put them in the Hilton. And he, he fed them with all the best food. And he gave them all the best wine. And he wanted to try to train them in the ways of the Babylonians. He wanted to Babylonianize them. Okay, so that word doesn't exist, but... It... So, so he, brought, he brought all these young men back, uh, Daniel and his three friends, and there were others, there was a, there was a group of them. And he, he gave them his wine and gave them his food. And Daniel and, the three, and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, said, we don't want to eat the king's food because if we do, we're going to defile ourselves. And we don't want to defile ourselves with the king's meat. So they refused to eat the food, and they prospered better than any of them. Now this is just, again, this is just a very thumbnail. Please listen to the messages. In chapter 2 of Daniel, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the, the great king, he had a dream. And he woke up and his dream troubled him. And he called all of his advisors, the Chaldeans they called them, the astrologers and all this. He called all of his advisors and he said, I need somebody to interpret my dream. And the advisor said, what was your dream? And Nebuchadnezzar said, I can't remember it. And the advisor said, well, how can we tell you if you can't remember? And Nebuchadnezzar said, if you, if you can't tell me my dream, you're nobody. I'm going to chop your head off. So all these, he made all his advisors try to tell him what this dream meant that they didn't know. Well, guess what? Daniel, God gave Daniel the understanding. And Daniel was able to interpret his dream. Okay? And in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, here was his dream. There was a big statue. And the head was gold. And the, and the chest was silver, and the, and the stomach was uh, bronze, and the legs were iron, and the feet were made of iron and clay. And Daniel said, These, this statue represents kingdoms of the world. And he said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. And what, what, what the statue represented, without going into great depth, was the world kingdoms that would have something to do with Israel. Okay, uh, Babylon, the Persians, uh, the Greeks... The Romans, and then those, those, those feet of clay and iron was like the Roman Empire kind of mixed up, which I believe is today, like democracy. But again, that's, it's too deep to go into. But he told Nebuchadnezzar, he said, this, these are the kings, the, uh, the kingdoms. And he said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the king of gold. You're the head of gold. You're the, you're the greatest king that ever lived in the secular world. And he said at the end of his dream what happened, this great stone came out of the mountain, a stone that was, was cut, uh, not cut with hands. It came down and it smashed the statue. And of course the stone represented the coming of Jesus Christ, who will establish his kingdom at the end of all things. So when Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of this dream, Nebuchadnezzar was impressed. And he said, oh, Daniel... Your God is, oh, yeah. He, and he made Daniel like a big shot. You know, he gave him, gave him like power. And you would have thought, if you read it, you would have thought that Nebuchadnezzar might have had, had come to know the Lord, you know, uh, Yahweh as his, as his God. But if you read chapter 3, the first thing Nebuchadnezzar did when he had this dream about the statue, you know what he did? He went out and built a statue. <laughs> he built a big old statue to represent the kingdoms of men. And he commanded that whenever the music would start, so they, they, he was going to have a big worship service for this statue. When the music would start, everybody had to bow down to the statue. Well, when the music started, everybody bowed down except three of them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we know the story. He took them and he threw them in a the fiery furnace. Because that was the punishment for not worshiping the statue. 
And when they went in the fiery furnace, he looked in there, and he looked like there was four men in there. And those three men came out, and they didn't even smell like smoke. And Nebuchadnezzar says, wow, man, you're God. Now, now I, 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 that was just a, just a little introduction. Because in the first chapter, we read about the witness of Daniel and his three friends. Uh, in, in, in the second chapter, we see about God's power. God showed Nebuchadnezzar his power to understand dreams. And in the third chapter, God showed his proof that he was able to deliver his own out of the fire. Now, I want you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 4. I want you to read this with me. It's really a remarkable Daniel chapter 4 I got it here and starting at verse 1 it says Nebuchadnezzar the king and all the people this Daniel chapter 4 it was recorded by Daniel, but it wasn't written by Daniel. In this chapter, we're going to read the words, the very words of Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to read his testimony. The king of Babylon, the king, the, the, the head of the most godless, antichrist place you could imagine, had a testimony of God. Listen to what he says. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. Well, Nebuchadnezzar didn't wish anybody peace before this. He was out conquering places, okay? I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God has wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. This was the guy who at one time thought that he was a god. And they worshipped him as a god. Because he was the mighty Nebuchadnezzar. Man, I, 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 I'm familiar. I'm trying to think how many presidents. I, I can go back to about like John Kennedy. Okay, I'm telling you how old I am. That I'm conscious enough to understand what they were saying. I never, had, I never heard no president say nothing like this. I never heard no president give glory and honor to God whose kingdom is above all. I've, I've never heard no American president say, they'll say, they'll give lip service to God and they'll say all this other stuff. I never heard any, any American president say this. American presidents are elected. Nebuchadnezzar, he was king forever. Listen to what he said. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my, in my palace. I was doing pretty good. And I saw a dream which made me afraid and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. For something to make Nebuchadnezzar afraid, it had to be something pretty powerful. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Now this is a different dream than I talked about before in chapter 2. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation of it. Nebuchadnezzar remembered the dream. He could tell him a dream, but they couldn't explain it. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. And in whom is the spirit of the holy gods? And before him I told him the dream. See, when Nebuchadnezzar first brought these boys over, he changed their names according to the gods that he worshipped. He tried to make them, he tried to change their identity. Do you know this world would just love to change what you think about yourself? They spend billions of dollars a year putting commercials on TV trying to change you, change the way you think about yourself. you know that? Okay. This is a little sideway. Verse 9. Nebuchadnezzar speaking. O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know... By the way, that word magician really doesn't mean, you know... Okay, you understand. Master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubles thee, tell me... <laughs> you have the, whole, the spirit of the holy god inside of you? No secret ought to trouble you. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's just... Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. Now this is, what, this is his dream. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven. 
and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and it was meat, uh, meat for all. The beasts of the field uh, had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heavens dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and uh, behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. Man, those, when those watchers come, look out. <laughs> because the watchers, they usually come bearing tidings that are not always the most pleasant. He cried aloud in verse 14 and said, Thus, cut down the tree and cut off the branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of its roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast of the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over it. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the, heaven, in the kingdom of men and gives it to whosoever he will and sets up over it the, the, the basis of men. Nebuchadnezzar, he found out in his dream, God is letting him know that even though he was the greatest king that ever lived up to that time, it wasn't he who put himself in that position. Do you know God sets up and takes down? God sets up and takes down? Oh, we vote. We were a democracy. We vote. Listen, God sets up and takes down. The reason why we got the president we got is because God put him there. There may be some people just don't quite get that. How could God put... If anybody sits in leadership, you might say, well, the people elected him. That's right. You know, God can control how the people vote. God gives us what, God gives us what we want. Sometimes. You've got to watch what you want. Sometimes God gives us what we deserve. God help us, don't give us what we deserve. Now, I'm just getting, it's getting too quiet in here. Okay. Somebody get mad at me. <laughs> but okay, now listen. All right. It says, reading that last part of verse 17, he rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whosoever he will and sets up over it the basis of men. Verse 18. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now, though, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, uh, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Okay? Now, Daniel, verse 19, whose name was Belteshazzar, he was astonished for one hour. Daniel didn't want to say nothing. Because he knew what the interpretation was. He knew what God was trying to tell Nebuchadnezzar. And he didn't want to say it. Because Daniel, I believe Daniel got, had respect for Nebuchadnezzar. He had been with him now. Daniel was an older man now from when he was a young man. It, it, this, was, this was years later. He was astonished for one hour and his thoughts troubled him. The king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof for thine enemies. That's bad coming from a prophet. <laughs> the tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, verse 21, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. Verse 22, it's you, O king, you are grown and become strong, for your greatness is grown and reaches unto heaven and your dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even when a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with dew of heaven and let the portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the, the decree of the Most High. This is what God says. That they shall drive thee from men. King Nebuchadnezzar, most powerful man on the face of the earth, you're going to lose your mind. You're going to lose. You're going to go insane. 
Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you'll make you to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you till thou know that the most high till you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. Then what will it take to get people to understand, not only people in America, but people all over the world, what will it take to get people to understand that God decides what goes on on this planet? He's in control. I don't care if you like who's, who's the president, who the president is, or who the governor is, or who the, the Congress is. I don't care if you like them or not. God, they're there because God let them get there. And if they're doing things that don't seem right, maybe it's because the people of this country are doing things that don't seem right. Somebody's thinking, when's he going to get to the good part? I'm, I am. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I am. Verse 27. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto you, and break off your sins by righteousness, and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be lengthening of thy tranquility. Daniel says, listen, it's a warning, Nebuchadnezzar. God is warning you. He's trying to get your attention. Why are we seeing all this stuff happen in our nation? Floods and tornadoes. God's trying to get our attention. Why are we seeing earthquakes and all these beginnings of sorrows? Because God is trying to shake us and wake us up and say, listen, don't you understand what's going on? He tries to get our attention, and the more He tries to get our attention, the more adamant we get and say, there's not God. There's no God. God, if you're up there... Listen. Listen to what they say. On TV. Listen to the pundits and the talking heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let somebody dare to say that a flood is, is, is God's, God's trying to, you know, sending, sending some kind of warning. Let, let some religious guy get up and say, well, you know, this happened because God's angry with America. Man, they'll hang him from the highest telephone pole. They'll make a joke out of him. Yet I guarantee you that when disaster strikes, it's God trying to get somebody's attention. Whether it's on a national level or on a personal level. When disaster strikes, God's trying to get your attention. In verse 28, it all came upon King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 29. At the end of 12 months, a year later, after he had this dream, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon? Man, look what I've done. I built this big city. The, the hanging gardens of Babylon, they were a legendary place, you know, great towers and worship. I've, I've, I've built this house for the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And you read the rest of this passage. That what Daniel said would happen to Nebuchadnezzar happened to him. He went insane. And for seven years they had him out in the field like a wild animal. He lost his mind. He lost his kingdom. He lost his ability to govern. He had no... He, he lost any, any, any idea of, of... You know, he was a great general. He was a great... A commander. He had no sense about him. He lost his mind. God warned him. You know what I think? When I, I listen and I look and see what's going on around me, man, we're losing our minds. The, our leadership. Things, every day you hear, you hear some kind of story in the paper or see it on the internet that somebody's losing their mind. To tell them in a veterans cemetery down in Texas, don't say God or Jesus. That just happened. Can't say God or Jesus. They they had crosses on a in a in a in a, in a public park and they made them take them down. We can go on and on and on and on. People are losing their minds. But I want to tell you something. 
I believe there's still some hope. Because the Bible tells us to keep to pray. Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind. But look at verse 34. Drop down. Now it's going to start getting good. Okay. All this stuff. It's going to start getting good. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. And mine understanding returned unto me. And what did he do? The first thing he did was he blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that lives forever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. You see, I believe that this Antichrist king of the Antichrist nation got saved. It took seven years of insanity. It took, it took God to show him just how powerful he was. But he got saved, and he started blessing God. And all the inhabitants of the earth, he says in verse 35, are reputed as nothing. And he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what are you doing? At the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom. And the excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven. Man, I'd love to hear a president of the United States say that. I ain't heard, I ain't heard no president say anything like that. Nebuchadnezzar got saved. Some people might disagree with me. That's all right. You preach in your church? Whatever you want. I'm going to preach. Nebuchadnezzar got saved. It took God to make him go crazy for seven years, but he got saved. And he called upon the name of the Lord. And my Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall not be ashamed. I said all that to say, well, why? You know. Listen. Don't you stop praying for Barack Obama. Don't you stop praying for Joseph Biden. Don't you stop praying for Tom Corbett. Don't you stop praying for the mayor of Arnold or the mayor of New Kensington or the mayor of Lower Borough. Don't you stop praying for the police and the people in authority. We've been commanded to pray for those who are in authority. Don't stop because God might just have mercy on one of them. God might make one of them go crazy for seven years and restore them and they'll stand up and give glory to Him. If He could do it with Nebuchadnezzar, He could do it with anybody. Don't stop praying. See, we can go on and on. Like I said, get the thing from Wednesday night, and I'll tell you, our nation, judgment's, judgment's coming. It's inevitable. It can't stop unless there's some kind of great big turnaround, and I don't see it happening. But we need to pray. We need to pray for our leadership. We need to pray for those in authority. We need to pray for the people that run our churches. Because, man, they've... They've taken a big turn. Now listen. If you read chapter 5 of Daniel, I'm not going to read it, but if you read chapter 5 of Daniel, you know what happened? Nebuchadnezzar died shortly after this. I believe he went on to be with the Lord. Because of what I read right here. But his predecessors weren't so tuned in. And his grandson, I believe, maybe great-grandson, a fellow named Belshazzar, not Belteshazzar, that's Daniel, but a guy named Belshazzar, he became the king. And if you read chapter 5 of the book of Daniel, you read about Belshazzar, who was, this is, you know, decades later, he became the king, and he didn't have great respect for the God of the Jews. And he took uh, the golden, uh, all, the, all the vessels that were taken from the, uh, from, the, from the temple. And he began to drink wine in them and he parted. And he made a mockery out of God. And you know what happened? You read about it. They were having this big party and everybody was making a big joke out of the God of gold and the God of silver, you know. And all of a sudden, somebody started writing on the wall. And when Belshazzar started, saw the writing on the wall, he dropped his cup. And his knees began to knock. And he got to be afraid. Because he realized that that was the hand of judgment. You know, you hear the term, the writing's on the wall. That's where it comes from. And I'll tell you right now, the writing's on the wall. It's on the wall of our government. 
It's on the wall of our churches. God is saying, here's what, here's, here, here was the message that God had for Belshazzar. He said, we've weighed your kingdom and you've been found wanting. And that night, in one night, the kingdom of Babylon fell to the Persians. That's, that's verified historically from secular history that that happened. You see, God's going to send judgment. He's going to send, the Bible says, Peter said judgment begins at the house of God. God's going to find out who's really preaching His Word, who's really His. And I'm not talking denominations, I'm not t- talking preachers, I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about His Word. Because you can find just as much foolishness in denominational, non-denominational, it doesn't matter. This is what counts right here, God's Word. And if, if they're preaching anything but this, the writing. Wade, you found one thing. I want us to pray this morning. Listen, tomorrow, July 4th, our nation's birthday, I want you to get on your knees and thank God you live in the United States of America. I'm telling you, get on your knees and say, God, I'm glad, thank you for letting me live in the United States of America. I want you not just tomorrow, but every day. Pray for those in leadership. Pray for them to get... Don't pray for them to make decisions. You know, we pray, Oh God, let this pass, let this not pass. Forget that. Pray that they get saved. If they get saved, you don't have to worry about what's going to pass or not pass. Pray for their salvation. Pray for their eternal destiny. Do that every day. And thank God, we have liberty. We have freedom. We're We're such a blessed people that we take it for granted. He told us to occupy till He comes. We think that means filling up church pews. We think that means building big churches and getting thousands of people in. Tell them whatever they want to hear and get them in the door. Pass the basket and I put the tithe. Listen. Pray for our nation. Pray that God might withhold His hand of judgment one more day. Because there might be one more person that needs to get saved. There might be one more person that needs to hear the gospel. There might be one more person that needs to hear the truth and come to the cross in the blood of Jesus and get saved by faith in the blood. There might be one more person who knows that God will stay His hand. Pray for our nation. And thank God, I'm so thankful I live in the United States of America. Because I have freedom. Liberty. That you can't find anywhere else on the face of this earth. Be grateful. And don't take it for granted. And use it for God's glory. Amen? Praise the Lord. We prepared the Lord's table this morning. And while that wasn't necessarily a communion message, it was a communion message. Because when we partake of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, what we're saying is that we're saying we're thanking God that we're living in the liberty that He provided for us. In Christ. In Christ. We have freedom. We have liberty to worship God. We have freedom and liberty to be about our Father's business. And let me tell you something about the liberty that God gives us. Let let me read something. I'm going to read this. While we're waiting for the kids to come up here. In Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. You see, we have liberty in the United States of America. Liberty that was purchased with the blood of the, the patriots and, and, and men and women who, who gave their lives in, in warfare throughout the centuries. My father fought in World War II. Some of your parents fought in, in, in wars. and Some of you may have a part to, uh, fought in, in the military. But listen to what the liberty that we have in Christ... He says in chapter 5 in Galatians, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us what? Free. Now see, that doesn't just apply to American Christians. That applies to Christians everywhere. That, That applies to Christians that are in Chinese prisons. They're free. That applies to Christians that live in Islamic nations where they have to hide for fear of their very lives. They're free. They might not be free according to their government, but they're free according to what Jesus did. Listen to what he says. 
Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You know, liberty, in a, in a natural level and in a spiritual level, it comes with a responsibility. To be free in the United States of America, we have a responsibility. You know, it says that freedom isn't free. It costs somebody something. He said, stand fast there in the liberty. And if you, if you, if you uh, drop down just a little bit. Verse 13. For brethren, you have been called unto what? Liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. That's our responsibility. That's what we're called to do.